Welcome to the deep dive. Today, uh, we are focusing all our attention on an object that is really, you know, turning the rules of interstellar travel on their head, the famous Wanderer 3i Atlas. Yeah, and this deep dive is, well, it's necessary because 3i Atlas recently completed its closest approach to the sun, its perihelion. Mm -hmm. And the findings coming back are, well, they're not just unusual. They seem to actively contradict known celestial mechanics. That's exactly why we're here. Our mission today is to really analyze this uh, stack of newest data, specifically focusing on this unprecedented finding of a significant non-gravitational acceleration acting on 3 i Atlas. This is the first uh, definitive measurement of its kind for this object. You need to figure out the implication. Is this the sign of like natural chaotic cometary destruction? Or is it evidence of something that demands a complete rethink of what's possible? Maybe even, you know, a technological signature. And the initial tracking, the analysis that led to this revelation, it's rock solid. This finding comes directly from navigation specialists, uh, formerly reported by Davide Fernosha, a navigation engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I mean, when JPL, the group responsible for navigating probes across the entire solar system, identifies an anomaly in an object's path, you know the deviation they're recording is precise, and it's serious. Okay, right. So let's unpack this acceleration then. When we talk about anything moving through space, an asteroid, a comet, even our own spacecraft, we assume gravity is the main driver, right? Newtonian physics dictates its path. What exactly did Farnosha's team measure that was um, pushing 3i Atlas off that expected course? Well, they took the key measurement when the object was about 1.36 astronomical units away from the sun that's, you know, significantly beyond the orbit of Mars. And they detected this steady, persistent push that just could not be attributed to the sun's gravitational pull alone. And crucially, that acceleration wasn't just uniform, was it? It had specific components. That's exactly right. The total non-gravitational acceleration was broken down into two distinct components, both operating within the orbital plane. First, there was the radial component. This is the acceleration pushing the object directly away from the sun. That was measured at 135 kilometers per day squared. Okay, that sounds, well, that sounds pretty standard, doesn't it? Like the rocket effect from gas escaping, which we see in normal comets. You know, the sun heats the ice, the jet stream pushes the comet back. Precisely. That part seems familiar. But here's where the measurement gets really interesting. The second component was the transverse acceleration. This measured 60 kilometers per day squared, and it represents a push that is uh, perpendicular to the sun's direction. Essentially, it's pushing the object sideways relative to its path towards or away from the sun. Wait, hang on. Why does that transverse component matter so much? If it's just sublimation, shouldn't the gas generally be ejected, like directly opposite the sun? That gives you the radial acceleration. A transverse push implies something is applying force sideways to that sun comet line. That seems much harder to explain naturally. It does. It implies either highly unusual spin dynamics, maybe some kind of weird rotation, or an ejection mechanism that is not purely aligned with the incoming sunlight. For just a passive natural object, yeah, that transverse thrust is a major puzzle piece. And we should probably put the magnitude of this whole deviation into context for you listening. When we hear numbers like kilometers per day squared, it can sound like the object just suddenly swerved off course. Yeah. But the actual deviation over time was pretty subtle, wasn't it? Oh, very modest, yes. It, especially when you consider the scale of the solar system. Over the course of a full month, this persistent non-gravitational push only resulted in a spatial shift of about maybe 10 times the radius of the Earth. It wasn't nearly enough to, say, change its fate dramatically or send it crashing into a planet or anything like that. But the fact that the underlying acceleration was measurable and constant, yeah. that means something fundamental was powering it. So the deviation itself was small, but the implications are, well, potentially immense. Right. So let's dive into those implications then. Since gravity alone can't explain it, and that transverse push makes simple sublimation look a bit suspect, we start with hypothesis A, the strongest natural explanation, the standard rocket effect, just from massive, massive mass loss. Yeah, this is the default position the first place you go. The idea is that the acceleration is due to volatile materials, ices, Gas is being aggressively heated by the sun and jetting out, conserving momentum. Okay, but when the navigation team actually ran the numbers backwards, you know, yeah. taking the acceleration they observed and assuming a typical gas ejection speed, like a few hundred meters per second, what did that calculation demand about the size and composition of 3 Atlas? What did it have to be doing? It demanded a, well, a staggering rate of decay. Just incredible. The calculation shows that for the observed thrust to be sustained naturally, the evaporation half-life of 3 Atlas is only about six months. 
and this is critical. It means that over the single month, it took the object to cross that perihelion scale. The object would have lost approximately a tenth of its total mass. Wow, a tenth of its entire mass in just one month. That's not just sublimation. That sounds like the object is actively, you know, shedding its existence. Why is that calculation so extreme compared to what we normally expect from comets? Well, think about a typical solar system comet, maybe like hale bopp or Halley's Comet. They lose mass gradually over many orbits, maybe a fraction of a percent per perihelion passage, if that. Losing 10% of your mass in 30 days, especially for an object that supposedly came from interstellar space, possibly largely dormant, it means it would have to be generating this vast, almost blinding, continuous plume of dust and gas. Yeah. It would essentially be melting at a catastrophic rate. So if that hypothesis is correct, then this enormous plume, it must be visible, right? Like right now. We shouldn't just be debating the acceleration numbers. We should literally see a vast expanding cloud around it. Exactly. That's the prediction. And this massive evaporation requirement, it ties directly into another observation that was already on the books. The unusual brightening that instruments like Stereo, Soho, and GOES-19 reported, they saw these massive rises in brightness throughout September and October 2025. Right. And for those maybe not familiar, those are primarily solar and environmental observation satellites. Stereo is the Solar Terrestrial Relations Observatory, SOHO is the Solar and Heliospheric Observatory, and GOES-19 is one of the geostationary operational environmental satellites. They just happen to catch three ILS during its approach. Mm -hmm. And their data show this really rapid increase in brightness. It scaled inversely with the distance from the sun to the power of negative 7.5. That incredibly steep power curve of negative 7.5 means the brightness wasn't just increasing because the sun was shining on it more directly. It was exploding almost exponentially as it got closer to the heat source. And that intense brightening, it fits perfectly with the idea of massive sublimation kicking up a huge cloud, probably full of reddish dust. Okay, so hypothesis A, the natural explanation, seems internally consistent then. Massive acceleration requires massive mass loss. And hey, we saw a massive brightness spike that could indicate just that. So why are we even considering an alternative? Why are we even talking about hypothesis B? Because the brightness spike wasn't the only anomalous observation. Yeah. And this is where the, um, the physics of light scattering completely fractures the simplicity of that sublimation model. We absolutely have to address the color shift. Ah, uh, the color shift. That's the real fly in the ointment for the natural model, isn't it? 3 a tail is reported to be getting dramatically bluer than the sun. Yes, and this is hugely counterintuitive. There are two major physics problems here. First, natural comet dust, the kind you'd expect in that massive plume, is known to absorb short wavelength light, blue light, and scatter long wavelength light, red light. So it should make the scattered sunlight appear redder. If the object is blowing off a giant plume of dust, which hypothesis A absolutely requires, it should look increasingly red as it does so. But it's looking blue instead. All right. And second, there's the object's temperature itself. The surface of 3 I Atlas, even at perihelion, is still incredibly cold compared to the sun. It's expected to be about 20 times colder than the sun's photosphere, which is around 5,800 Kelvin. Colder objects naturally emit light more heavily on the red end of the spectrum black body radiation, you know. To shine blue, you generally require immense heat, often in the realm of tens of thousands of degrees or some non-thermal emission process. Okay, so we have these two conflicting demands. The acceleration seems to demand a massive catastrophic plume of mass loss, which should make the object look incredibly red and dusty. But instead, the object is defying thermal physics and scattering physics by looking aggressively blue. That is the core conflict, precisely. This bluer appearance at perihelion is now being formally categorized as the ninth anomaly reported for 3 Ialis. We've had eight previous strange observations noted over time, things related to its orbital plane, its initial lack of detectable activity when it was further out, hints about its composition. But this blue color, right at the point of maximum solar heating, it's arguably the most inexplicable one yet under standard models. So if the color can't be explained by passive solar heating or a massive reflective dust plume, well, this opens the door wide for hypothesis B, doesn't it? The unconventional explanation. That the non-gravitational acceleration, along with the blue shift, is actually a technological signature, maybe an internal engine. That's the alternative theory gaining traction, yes. It suggests that if the acceleration is being generated artificially by something internal, that system could potentially provide two things simultaneously. One, the sustained thrust needed for the measured acceleration, including that tricky transverse component. And two, 
potentially the immense heat or even an artificial light source required to shift the scattered or emitted light toward the blue end of the spectrum. It sort of neatly connects the two major observed anomalies that are otherwise in conflict. And it's fascinating, isn't it, that the transverse acceleration we talked about earlier, that sideways push, that would actually be much easier to achieve and control with some kind of engineered propulsion system compared to just chaotic natural sublimation. Absolutely. A passive system really struggles to generate a consistent transverse component like that, an active engineered system. It could potentially dial it in precisely. So now the dilemma for the scientific community is crystal clear. Is the mass loss prediction from hypothesis A true? Will we see that massive plume? Or are the color and acceleration anomalies together signaling something far outside our current framework of natural objects? Which means we have a critical, very near future test coming up, a test that will likely severely wound one of these two hypotheses. So what is the path to resolution here? We need to see if 3 Iadios is currently surrounded by that one-tenth mass plume, right? We do. And, and we have immediate and near-term observation opportunities lined up. The very first look is happening, well, basically right now, in early November 2025. ESA's JUICE spacecraft, that's the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, currently on its long journey out to the Jovian system. It happens to be positioned to be the first to actively look for that large mass loss, that big plume of gas. So that initial data from JUICE will be absolutely vital. And then the grand finale of observation opportunities happens next month in December. That's right. December 19, 2025. That is the date 3I Atlas makes its closest approach to Earth. Now, it sold a pretty hefty distance, 269 million kilometers, so no danger there. But this proximity maximizes the opportunity for really detailed observation from Earth's vicinity. We're talking hundreds of ground-based telescopes alongside the, you know, the gold standard space instruments Hubble and critically the Webb Space Telescope, JWST. They will all be pointed at this one object. So those December observations, that's really the moment of truth, isn't it? If the object looks massive, shrouded, maybe reddish, and has a huge, dirty skirt of gas and dust around it, hypothesis A holds. Natural comet, just a really weird one. But if it's mostly intact, seems to be holding onto its mass, and is still shining with this strange, non-cometary blue light, then we are looking at a potential paradigm shift. And, you know, this brings us back to a really crucial point about how science must approach truly anomalous data. It was highlighted in an interesting luncheon discussion recently, actually led by the author of one of our source articles. Oh, tell us about that connection. How does critical thinking play into this? Well, the conversation at this luncheon focused on another major puzzle in cosmology, the persistent, very serious discrepancy between the current measured expansion rate of the universe, the Hubble constant, and the rate predicted by analyzing the cosmic microwave background radiation from the early universe. Statistically, the difference looks real. It's significant. But cosmologists currently lack an elegant, standard theoretical model to fully explain why they're different. Okay, so what's the lesson from that situation that applies directly to our blue accelerating 3 ILS? The crucial lesson, the takeaway, is this. It is a fundamentally poor professional practice to conclude that the data must be wrong simply because you lack a satisfactory, comfortable theoretical explanation for it. We cannot, and we really shouldn't, just discard the carefully measured acceleration from JPL or the bizarre color shift observed by multiple telescopes just because they might point toward an uncomfortable conclusion. Whether that conclusion is completely new comet physics we don't understand or something even more exotic like a technological signature, we have to trust the measurements first. That really is the ultimate scientific challenge, isn't it? Trust the data, even when it breaks the models. Okay, so let's just summarize the core dilemma facing every observer who's waiting for those December images. Is this non-gravitational acceleration a signature of massive cometary death throes, meaning we absolutely must see a catastrophic, probably reddening plume of gas and dust? Or is it a signature we just can't explain naturally, potentially coupled with an internal heat source or even artificial light that's causing this ninth critical blue anomaly? That is the fundamental choice, the fork in the road. And if the observations coming from JUICE in November, and especially the really detailed images and spectra captured around December 19th, if they do not reveal clear evidence of that required 10th mass loss, and if the object somehow maintains its unusual blue color without the huge volatile plume that should accompany that level of thrust, then we face a really deep question. A question maybe not just about what 3 il is doing, but about the very limits of our understanding of what a natural object can even be. Exactly. So what will those observations on December 19th tell you? If this object is accelerating in this strange way and shining blue, 
all while apparently holding on to most of its mass. Well, we're looking at something that genuinely challenges every elegant model we have built for interstellar visitors. And that uncertainty, that tension between the familiar natural explanation and the potentially unconventional one, that's precisely why this deep dive is so essential right now. And it's a conversation I guarantee you we will absolutely be revisiting very soon.